this is how the Muslims worship, right? So if I said, look, this chairman or the people worship Didat, meaning that they, man, they loved him with exceeding love, right? That, but now you say worship. Now, the, if the people have a wrong idea, they say, look, what did they do? Did they make ablution and come? And did they fall down prostrate before Mr. Didat? He says, no. He said, what do you mean they worshipped him? He said, no, no, no. Oh, man, you know, they were gone mad after him. Now, that's quite a different thing. You see, now you are using a word and you are explaining something else figuratively. But that's exactly so, what you are doing now. No, I'm not doing that. Jesus Christ and all the prophets, they had a form of worship, the Jews, which you are not following, you don't know. Look, and Abraham fell on his face and prayed to God. And Moses and Aaron fell on their faces and prayed to God. And Joshua fell on his face and prayed to God. And Jesus fell on his face and prayed to God. Look, everybody falling on their faces and praying. What is this? This is the way you worship God. Fall on your face and pray. The Pope, wherever he goes, he kisses the ground. He makes the prostration, as the Muslim does. See, he's maybe, I don't know, he's communing with the soil or what, I don't know. But he's doing exactly as the Muslim does. He, then you might say he's worshiping the ground. He goes to Nigeria, he worships the ground there. He goes to Poland, he worships the ground there. No, he's not worshiping. There is. He's showing some kind of humility, respect, maybe. But now, Moses, this is how he did it. Jesus did it. Abraham did it. Joshua did it. But you don't do it. So you have your own idea about worship. Could we, uh, it's running out of time, brothers. Could we have, uh, as we are standing here now, as we are standing here now, could you put a question? I will include you, sir. Could we end there a question per person? Right? Could you speak into the microphone? Otherwise, they can't hear you. I believe that Mr. Dirad is well-schooled, like the previous gentleman said, and understand that he has a great intellect. Right now, is that the question? No, not yet. Oh, because I would have said yes. I admire him for his courage as well as his knowledge. But there's one thing I am quite disappointed about, Mr. Dida. Could you, could you put him a question, please? Yeah, it, no, let, it let boils me, down me, to that. Let me explain. This one might solve the other people's problem. Yeah, yeah. Some people even of the Muslims feel that I'm unfair if I stop you. But let me put it to you this way. If you want to have a lecture to the people, call them together and say, this man has called the people. We ask, could you ask a point which is ticklish, let him regal out of it and explain to the audience or get caught. But please do not give another lecture. No, I think I'm not unfair. giving a lecture. I'm, this, this is leading up to the lecture. I'm, I didn't prepare myself to, <laughs> to, to get the man down as such. All right, my question is that I want to know how Mr. Didat interpret, understands and interpolates all kind of context of the Bible. For instance, Jesus uh, in the book of um, John says, uh, the Father and I, or I and the Father are one. How does he explain that? Because if I am Mr. Jonathan as I am, I can't be my father and I cannot make a statement claiming to be that my father is me. Mr. Either. Jonathan, uh, if that is your name, could I say, you must have listened attentively because you are interested, but so was I. I'm open to correction, but I think Mr. Didat explained that, the very two thing when he says, me and my father are one. Am I right, brothers? Um, did he not explain that? Mr. Or did he? Mr. Chairman? No, all the, no, no I'll answer that's the question then. Allah. Thank you very much. As, uh, no, that's Mr. The Chairman, question. just allow me to. You see, um, like this gentleman that was here before me, Mr. Didat was interpolating things, like for instance, he but read now, something but in... But now, Ola, you've asked the question, he can answer, he can also understand the question. Okay. I can, sure. Thank you. I did explain, I think, that this oneness that Jesus was talking about was in its context, verses 28, 29, 30. That is the context. That no man can pluck them out of my hand, 28. No man can pluck them out of my father's hand, verse 29. I and my father are one. That is the context, and I feel that any reasonable person could see that. But since the Christian has an idea that this oneness implies, you know, getting into a sausage, like one sausage, one piece, like uh, God Almighty told Adam and Eve that they twin shall be one flesh, like a sausage. 
They were not, they were still two separate persons. Now this same John, the one that we have quoted John chapter 10 verse 30, in John chapter 17 verse 20 to 22 he explains what oneness is. He says that they all may be one, O any one, all may be one, as thou Father art in me and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, who the disciples among them, the traitor Judas, among them Peter who cursed, abused and swore him, among them the ten who left him in the lurch when he was most in need, all these, the Father, the Son and all these twelve may be one, that they all may be, also may be one in us, I in them and thou in me and that they may be made perfect in one. I'm only quoting the yep. same John. So in other words, all the 12 disciples and Jesus and God made into one sausage. Is that what that oneness implies? All, you know, putting through a mincer and taking them out as a one sausage. What is this oneness? It is a oneness in purpose. You see, the same oneness that Jesus has explained in John 10, 30, same oneness, Peter and uh, Judas and the doubting Thomas, everybody, all with one with God, one person, I in you and you in me and they in us. What is this? Sausage. So if you understand it like a sausage, then I know I have no answer. But I says, no, this is not that one sausage business is talking about. It's talking about they all are one in purpose to do the will and plan of God. That oneness. There is no other oneness. He's one with God, meaning whatever God wants him to do, he's doing. He's vibrating on the same wavelength as God. That is oneness. Not he becomes God or God becomes man, Jesus. Thank you. Next question, please. Mr. Didat, I would like to ask you this. <clears throat> I think this is my second time. Into, into. Can I just bring it down? That Come closer to the microphone. Okay. I would like you have given us a definition of Allah and John chapter 1, the word, God, the three, the various words. I would like to ask you the question tonight is that how can you separate deity from deity when the Bible says that in the beginning God, which means you never mention this word tonight, you mention Eli, you mention Allah, you mention the Greek words for God in the Greek word, but you never mention Elohim. When it is in a plural form with a masculine ending, can you just explain to, for, to me how do you divorce deity from deity? Thank you. Uh, the problem is that the Westerner is reading an Eastern book. The Bible is an Eastern book full of metaphors and similes. And the very first people who came in touch with this book were the Greeks and the Romans. Now, the Greeks and the Romans, they had their man gods beyond counting. You know them. Jupiter, the god of heaven. Pluto, the god of hell. Vulcan, the god of fire. Neptune, the god of the sea. Mars, the god of war. And Zeus was the father of all these gods with his many wives and many children. This was Greek mythology. But among such a people goes a new religion, new idea about a new son of God born in Palestine, Jesus Christ. So what was metaphorical to the Jew became literal to the Greek. And they became the pioneers of that message to your forefathers, to the Westerner as well as to you. You know, Indians, coloreds, Africans, all. The white man, he inherited from the Greeks and the Romans, and in turn, he gave that theology to you. Now, im Elohim, if I went on to explain, El means God in Hebrew. Ela means God in Hebrew. Elohim also means God in Hebrew. And you say it's plural, and that's very correct. It is very correct that it is in the plural. But you see, the Hebrews, as well as the Arabs, both are Semites, Semitic languages, and they both have two types of plurals in their language. There is a plural of respect, and there's a plural of numbers. In every Eastern language, including my own, we have two types of plurals plural of numbers and plural of respect. So this im, you ask the Jew, it's his book. He says, when you say hello im, are you thinking of Jehovah, Moses, and who else? He said, no, 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 there's only God. But he said, who is this im? So he said, no, it's a plural of respect. 
Come to the Quran, same. In the Quran we read, Inna nahnu nazzalna zikra wa inna lahu lahafizun. That it is for us, us, to send down the revelation and it is for us to protect it. Now who is this us? Ask the Muslims. Muhammad, Holy Ghost, Jibreel and Allah. He says no. Who is this us? It's Allah. But he said, why is this us? He said, this is a plural of respect. And no Arab Christian has ever asked a Muslim in this 1,400 years, who is this as in the Quran? When the Quran says, Qul hu wallahu ahad, say, he is God the one and only, and yet he says, inna, inna, we have created the heavens and the earth, and we have done this, and we, who is this we? He said, no, this we is a plural of respect in our language. This is a plural of respect in Hebrew. John? Next question, please. Salam um, Adidat. My question that I want to put to you, I have noticed that you so fair to the Hebrews, to the Jews actually, and the Jews is just as ignorant as Mr. Ahmadidat. <laughs> this is my scripture. For unto us, listen, Mr. Ahmadidat, John, what do you say to this? For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Now this prophet Isaiah, you know the prophet Isaiah, and this one that he talk about is Jesus. Now why did he use the word, and he shall be called the Almighty God? Thank you. And he shall be called the Almighty God. I want to know who called him the Almighty God. You have 27 books in the New Testament. In the 27 books, who called him Jesus the Almighty God? Yeah, let, let John in. Isaiah the Shh. prophet which I said, you have said. He shall be called. Yeah. Right. This was written 600 years before Jesus was born. Yeah. Right. So when you say he shall be called, then somebody must call him so. Mm -hmm. 27 books in the 27 yeah. books of the New Testament there is nowhere he's called the Almighty God there is nowhere he's called Emmanuel you see Emmanuel means God with us now this is a quality of a person and that quality of a person when he displays like Eli Eli means my God you I know told, this I talk about the Old Testament yes yes I'm talking about the Old Testament Eli in the Old Testament in the first book of Genesis 60 times the word Eli is used yeah. Eli means my God. You said that. Shh. Eli means my God. Is the name of a priest. Eli is the name Eli, of a priest. Not Eli. 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 All right. You, you. <laughs> Thank you. I'm. You see now you pronouncing like a, a European. Yeah. I'm pronouncing like a Jew. 